about people not taping people for public reasons. I am a fan of tape for the same reason I am a fan of cops wearing body cams. I think the tape allows people to understand what is and is not happening in given places. So instead of there being a bunch of varying reports made, this is, and this is reflecting on me. Okay, so first of all, <laughs> thanks to Young America's Foundation for sponsoring this event. Thanks to the Young America's Foundation group here on campus for putting it together. And, um, and I have to say, the administration has made this relatively tough. Uh, this is the first event that I've had to speak at where, uh, and I've spoken at literally dozens of schools at this point, where uh, the administration mandated that I be introduced and also talked off. So I'm an eminently dangerous man, clearly. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, here's, the, here's the note from the, uh, let's see, who is this from? The director of Campus Life, Dr. Dan Moore, that went out earlier this week for people who haven't been following. We recognize that the speaker's views on diversity have been seen as controversial. Westmont does not endorse the speaker's ideological or partisan perspectives. However, our responsibility as a college is to provide an educational environment that interacts with differing ideas and is willing to ask hard questions in pursuit of truth. The purpose of the format outlined above is to facilitate that kind of discussion and create an environment that fosters critical thinking and engagement with ideas and beliefs, even those that may be uncomfortable which of course requires that there be an intro and exit from a, from a staff member here to ensure that I don't say anything too egregious without being questioned. It's not like I've been doing this for most of my life. <laughs> uh, this letter, by the way, was, was met from, uh, let's see, this professor, uh, is Bruce Fisk in the crowd? We have Bruce Fisk here. No, no Bruce Fisk here. Okay, so Bruce Fisk wrote back, quote, during an, during an election season in which inflammatory rhetoric has often been racially laden, I wonder about the wisdom of giving a platform to someone who does not seem, to me, someone with admittedly liberal leanings. First of all, you're not liberal if you want to shut down other people. You're a leftist. He says, to be helping, I must assume that you did your homework and know what you are getting, and that you regard Shapiro as a positive conservative voice in our culture. I would welcome the chance to hear from you why you think this is the case. Well, Professor Fisk, welcome to America, where it turns out people can host speakers that you don't like, speakers with whom you disagree, speakers that you may have questions about, it turns out they don't have to justify to you why they're having me any more than you have to justify why people's dollars are being spent on presumably your class. And I do wonder if the classes at this university are, for, that are leftist are accompanied by introductions from professors, other professors, to ensure that nobody is offended. So with those preliminaries out of the way, and thank you, by the way, all for, for coming and finding your way here. I hear that the administration conveniently forgot to put out signs directing people to the actual event, so that's, that's wonderful as well. <laughs> and by the way, um, I look forward to the administration chartering Young America's Foundation for next year, because I hear that after last year, there was some hubbub about chartering the group because it was too controversial and too terrible when you had David Horowitz. This, of course, would be ideological submission and, uh, and, and an attempt to quash ideology, so I certainly hope that the administration here will not do that with a good-hearted group of students who simply wish to present an alternative point of view. Okay, so here's what we're actually going to talk about with those preliminaries out of the way. And it's so long as my arm doesn't get tired here, good thing I've been working out. Okay, so, so we're going to talk about five different terms that are routinely used by folks on the left in order to quash debate and in order to ensure that nobody's feelings are hurt. These are diversity, white privilege, trigger warnings, microaggressions, and safe spaces. The Hall of Fame of stupidity, stupidity, idiocy, and repression. Let's just jump in right with diversity. So you heard that buzzword diversity in the administration's announcement of this event. Ideological diversity means that anytime somebody whom, with whom you disagree speaks, either they have to be shut down or they have to be wrapped in a cocoon of other ideology a cocoon of restrictions to ensure that nobody is offended. This is diversity of thought according to the left. But the real diversity that the left cares about is not diversity of thought, because the reality is that unfortunately too many campuses uh, are even worse than this one. At Cal State Los Angeles, the president there actually just canceled the event outright when I was supposed to speak there, suggesting that in order to uphold diversity it was important that I not speak, because real diversity is ensuring that people with whom you disagree shut the hell up. So. Here is the, so, but the left does care about one particular type of diversity. The kind of diversity that the left cares about deeply is diversity of skin color. That is the only type of diversity that the left cares about. Now, I tend to be of the opinion that diversity of skin color is ultimately meaningless. That the level of melanin in your skin is utterly irrelevant to your quality as a human being. 
I tend to agree with the Martin Luther King line that I care about the content of your character rather than the color of your skin. If you disagree with that, then you are a racist. If you believe that the values that a person upholds, if you believe that the behavior in which someone engages is secondary to the color of their skin, you are by definition, of, uh, by definition a racist. Unfortunately, the left tends to fall into this category. The left cares deeply about diversity of skin color and ethnicity and birthplace, but they don't care particularly about virtue or decency. So the left's idea of diversity is the, is the diverse TV gang, right? The kind of gang that you see on, on TV that doesn't exist in real life, where it's like a Native American guy, a Hispanic guy, a black woman who's a lesbian, and they're all robbing a bank together. That's, that's real diversity. That's the kind of diversity that ought to matter. But diversity of viewpoint that seems a little bit less interesting to folks on the left. And again, virtue comes second. So if you have a group of really, really good people, all of whom happen to be white, then this is a less good group because all the people in it are white, even if they're not white because they were excluding people, especially if they're not white because they were excluding people, just because those were the people who met the qualifications for a particular group. So why exactly is the left so obsessed with race? Why are they so obsessed with racial diversity? The reason the left is so obsessed with racial diversity as opposed to diversity of thought, is because for the left, there's only one rule when you boil leftism down, and that is equality of outcome. Not equality of opportunity, equality of outcome. All that matters is that we all end up in the same place. And if we don't end up in the same place, then that must have been because some sort of evil, terrible, exploitative discrimination took place that made all of this happen. So if you have two people, this is the Bernie Sanders view of life. If you have two people in a room, and one person has $5 in his pocket and one person has $1 in his pocket, the person with $5 must somehow have exploited the person with $1 or the system must have led to the inherent exploitation of the person with $1. Doesn't matter if the person with $1 made a lot of horrible life choices and the person with $5 invented Facebook. What really matters is that the outcome is unequal, therefore the system itself is corrupt and perverse. And when you have group, di group differences, in terms of average income, for example, if let's say black Americans on average earn less than white Americans on average, which is true, right? That's, that's accurate. Then that must be because of an evil, inherently terrible system of white privilege. And white privilege, of course, is the idea that if you're white in America, if you're born white in America, then you are inevitably the beneficiary of this evil white system that was built for you. Individualism goes by the wayside under this, under this rubric. Individualism is insufficient because, again, we don't all end up in the same place. We have to tear down this white privilege idea, right? We have to tear, pri white privilege must be torn down. Now, this is very seductive to people on all sides of the, the ethnic and racial divide. If you, are a, if you are an ethnic minority and you're underperforming individually, it's very convenient to be able to blame white privilege for the fact that you're underperforming in some way. You just get to claim that the system has exploited you or that your neighborhood has been exploited by the evil white oppressive system. And voila, all responsibility for individual action resulting in good results, all of that is gone. And for white folks, it's also pretty seductive because the reality is that if you're a white, heterosexual, cisgender male, if you're one of these, these people who is obviously the beneficiary of this white privilege, then you can't get out of this, right? You're stuck with this. You were born into it. You're stuck with this no matter what you do. But white privilege offers you a way out of this dilemma, the dilemma that says that you're evil just because of how you were born. Right? The, the, the way to get out of this is to just proclaim from the rooftops your white privilege. All you have to really do is just go out there and proclaim that you, your success, it's all due to these long dead people who designed a system that was designed to benefit you. Right? All you have to do is scourge yourself. You take out an actual scourge and you shout mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. And then everybody just says, okay, well I guess you're all right now. You're one of us because you've recognized your own white privilege. And anytime you want to say anything about a, a standard of behavior that applies to all, then you just say, well, you know, I'm not going to say that anymore because obviously I've been too ensconced in my white privilege to be able to speak about that. This is the purest form of identity politics. It's the same sort of identity politics that says a man can't comment about abortion because obviously a man doesn't have a womb, unless, of course, a man thinks he's a woman, in which case things just get incredibly confusing because he doesn't have a womb, but he still wants to talk about abortion. So what, oh, what do we do? <laughs> so the, this white privilege idea has gained lots of credence and credibility on campus, and it's also dead wrong. It's dead wrong. Okay, the fact is that the reason in a free modern America, I'm not talking about 50 years ago, 60 years ago when Jim Crow laws were in place. I'm not talking about 150 years ago when slavery were in place. I'm talking about now. Now, for people my age, you know, I'm talking about young black people. 
The idea that you are failing in society because of some endemic system of white privilege is nonsense. The real reason certain people win and certain people lose in American society, in any free society, with equal rules is because some people make bad decisions and some people make good decisions. Okay, individuals that make good decisions end up with better results. Individuals that make bad decisions end up with universally terrible results. This isn't to say there's no such thing as privilege. There is, but it's called what, I, what I've termed decision privilege. Turns out that in a free system, your decisions have an impact on your outcome. So for example, here's the greatest privilege in American life. It's the two-parent family privilege. If you live in a, in a household with two parents, you are privileged. You're privileged because your parents made good decisions. And if you choose to get married and then give birth and have a baby, then your child will be privileged. So here's the reality. For black couples, right? Blacks are obviously the, the oppressed underclass in this white privilege system. For black couples who have a kid, right? For, for two parent households, the poverty rate in the United States is 7%. Seven. The poverty rate for white single mothers is 22% in the United States. What happened to white privilege? Did just disappear? Why, isn't the white, why aren't the white single women doing better than the black folks? I mean, but that's not how it works. It turns out that if you want to be not permanently poor in America, the easiest way to do this is not to have babies out of wedlock. Here's another privilege, the not committing crimes privilege. If you don't want to go to jail, it turns out the easiest way not to do this is not to commit a crime. A disproportionate number of black people are not in prison because the cops are going around randomly arresting innocent black people and throwing them in prison. It's because there are a disproportionate number of black people committing crimes. And this has been true literally for decades. It's not because there is systemic bias inside the criminal justice system. The truth is the criminal justice system systemically under prosecutes black murderers, which is why the murder rate in black communities is so much higher because fewer murderers get caught this is one of the reasons, right? The fact is that they are under policed. Black communities are under policed, which is why there's lack of rule of law, which is why there is a higher crime rate. It's also why disproportionately black people are arrested in these areas because there is higher crime rate. You send the cops where the crime is. When police, by the way, do come into contact with black folks, the Black Lives Matter group, they claim that the cops are just going out there to shoot black people randomly. And the fact of the matter is less than 40 black people in the United States last year in a country of well over those people were unarmed and a half of the people who were unarmed were people who were attacking cops and trying to take guns off of them. This is not an epidemic of cop violence against black people. In fact, in fact, John Jay College did a study and what they found is that on a proportional level, on a statistical level, the reality is precisely the opposite. If you're a white person and you get into an altercation with a cop and that, co that altercation gets violent, you have a better shot of being shot by the cop if you are white than if you are black, for obvious reasons, right? If you shoot a black person in an altercation, it ends up like Michael Brown. If you shoot a black guy in an altercation, it ends up looking like, uh, like various, other, various other sundry situations that we've had all over the country where the cop didn't actually do anything wrong, but is targeted anyway. Okay, how about stop and frisk, right? There's another element of the systemically biased, the, the white privileged criminal justice system. Truth is that, so what they say is stop and question and frisk, which is what the actual policy is. Stop, question and frisk, the policy is designed so that cops would see somebody casing a joint, right, walking outside a jewelry store, for example, and they would go over and they would question them. And then if they saw that they were walking funny or they had a bump under their coat, they would frisk them. That's what stop, question and frisk was. So folks on the left suggest that they were disproportionately racially profiling. The reality is precisely the opposite. Again, between January and June 2008, 98% of all gun assailants in New York City, which is where stop and frisk became prominent, 98%, 98, okay, were, were black or Hispanic. The, percentages, uh, the percentage of people who were black or Hispanic who were actually pulled over for stop and frisk by the cops during that same period was 85%. So the cops were actually over, over stopping and frisking white people. How about pulling people over for speeding? How about the, the idea that there is this white privilege with regard to cops for some odd reason love pulling over black people, right? This is the idea that cops are desperate to pull over black people who are speeding. Well, in New Jersey, there was a federal lawsuit filed against the state of New Jersey for racial profiling, right? For driving while black. There's only one problem. They did a federal study. It's a federal study commissioned under the first black president, Bill Clinton, right? And this, and the, and the, and what the, and what they found, what they found is that 25% of all speeders in the state of New Jersey were black and 23% of drivers who were actually stopped for speeding were black. How about sentencing disparities? I'm just going through all the myths now of white privilege. How about sentencing disparities? The idea that white people do less time in prison than black people. False, not true. This has been true since the 90s. As early as 1994, the Justice Department surveyed felony cases in the country's 75 largest urban areas and found lower felony prosecution rates 
for blacks than for whites. How about sentencing disparities between powder and crack cocaine? Well, it turns out that the reason that people get different sentences for powder cocaine and crack cocaine, <laughs> the reason people get different sentences is because crack cocaine is more addictive and easier to distribute and was absolutely eviscerating inner cities. It was black legislators from the inner city who were desperate to create higher penalties for crack cocaine. And by the way, the federal penalty for crack cocaine, for possessing five grams of crack cocaine, is precisely, precisely the same as the penalty for possessing five grams of crystal meth, which is a disproportionately white drug. So the idea that this is all just white privilege, bias against powder cocaine, because powder cocaine is being used by white people. How about all those, those hicks who are using crystal meth and producing it? They're all white, and they get exactly the same penalty. All of this is white privilege. Everything is white privilege. When things go wrong in the black community, it's white privilege. When there's a riot in Baltimore, which is a majority black city with a majority black police force, with a black police chief, with a black mayor, with a majority black city council, with a black president and a black attorney general, that's all white privilege. That riot was white privilege. Or, you know, as long as we're talking about privilege and the people who are disproportionately benefited by the system, as long as we're talking about that, why not talk about Asian privilege? I mean, let's get real. Those are the people who are really benefiting from the system, all those, those jerk Asians who have just been glomming off the system they built for themselves, and they've been so successful because of all the Asian founders who wrote that Asian constitution to benefit all the Asian people. It turns out that since the mid-90s, the reality has been that Asians have been penalized on the SATs because they're a minority group that does too well, because Asians do too well as a group. So Princeton University found in the mid-2000s that Asians were being penalized in their applications at the top college by 250 SAT points. This is back in the day when it was, when it was out of 1,600. The, the, sorry, black folks were getting a 250 point bonus on the SATs, Asians were being penalized 50. So in other words, 1550 from an Asian guy was equivalent to a 1250 from a black guy. All right, this is what Princeton University found. And that, that makes sense, because again, we live in, an, in a privileged Asian system designed by Asians for the benefit of Asians, and these Asians have never really gotten over it, they need to acknowledge their Asian privilege, and this is of course why the Constitution is written in Korean. <laughs> So what happens when no matter how much you struggle, no matter what you do, you can't achieve a quality of outcome because it turns out that individuals make different decisions and some of those decisions are good and some of those decisions are bad. Okay, well what happens? Well then we have to redefine what equality of outcome looks like. It no longer looks like equality of outcome economically, instead it now looks like equality of feelings. Right? We all have to feel equal. It doesn't matter if we are equal, we have to feel equal and that means everyone's feelings must be protected. And normally this is where I give the trigger warning, folks. If your feelings are about to get hurt, I just don't care because I live in a country where I don't have to care. This is the, the First Amendment protects my ability not to care about your feelings. And you don't have to care about my feelings. That's what's great about America, is that I can say things, you can think I'm an idiot, that's totally fine. You can say things, I can think you're an idiot, that's totally fine too. None of this requires a trigger warning because we're not a bunch of weak three-year-olds. Okay, trigger warnings are the idea that if something is going to offend you, I'm supposed to announce it beforehand to prevent your feelings from being hurt. Now, everything has to be accompanied by a trigger warning. You know, the the, the pre-announcement by the, by the administration is essentially a trigger warning. You may be offended by what you're about to see. Ooh. <laughs> right, now, what this does is it actually creates a bunch of weak-minded namby-pambies. Because the reality is that in the real world, you're not going to be greeted with trigger warnings. When people say things that you don't like, you can disagree, you can agree, it doesn't really matter. Bottom line is, life is, is not a series of trigger warnings. Life is a series of things that you learn from that you don't there's an If there's an inequality, that behooves inequity. It, it betrays inequity, rather. It, it, it demonstrates there's an inequity, not cause and effect. And most people don't believe this. This is why you know, it, it annoys so many people when there's a terrorist attack and President Obama will say that it's just a random act of terror and it's not an, an act of Islamic terrorism because people inherently know that if, a, if, if one ideology is responsible for virtually all suicide bombings in the West, for example, then maybe that ideology has something to do with the behavior. Uh, it's, it, the left wishes to get rid of that because again, equality of outcome is the only imperative. And equality of outcome doesn't exist because we all make different decisions. And uh, what are your thoughts on elevating uh, levels of national security based upon statistical probability in regards to certain groups? So basically you're asking me about, about ethnic, racial, religious profiling. So my answer is the same as it is with regard to crime, and that is that you go where the, where the suspects are. So it's a waste of time to distribute. You know, there, there's always scarcity. There's no such thing as a, as a plethora of law enforcement. There's always a scarcity. So the question is where are you going to deploy that law enforcement? 
for my money, it's a waste of time to deploy your anti-terror law enforcement in Swedish communities. I just don't think that that's, that's where you put your law enforcement. It's just, it's a waste of time and it's a waste of money. Uh, you, you put your law enforcement where the crime is happening. Otherwise, you're wasting time and wasting money. Hi, Mr. Shapiro. I'm a big fan. I was in your show in Seattle before you left. I'm really sad about that one. Um, well, you can get my podcast still. So that's yeah, I love Daily Wire and all your stuff. Anyway, my question is, uh, what can I, as a white, cisgender, thin, tall, able-bodied man, do <laughs> actively and or passively combat cultural Marxism? <laughs> well, you can start by saying stuff like that, right? Uh, yeah, I think that you know, speaking out as loudly as you possibly can when you can is, is the only way to, to really do it. Uh, I would recommend to all the people who are of my persuasion in the room, people who agree with me in the room, uh, don't be stupid when it comes to your professors. It's not worth sacrificing your grade to speak up to professors who, who may dislike what you're saying. Uh, it's, it's better to get the degree, go make a lot of money, and then give a major donation to the school and get the professors who discriminate fired. That's, 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 my, that's my personal view of the situation. So, um, you know, what can you do? Reven success is the best revenge. Be highly successful in your chosen field of endeavor and speak out loudly on behalf of virtue. Thank you. <laughs> um, so you claim that your second like virtue is that you you want to be able to speak without being punched in the face, right? Yeah, I'm big on that. Okay. <laughs> How do you respond to um, Trump condoning violent behavior? Trump is a horrible human being. I mean, if you haven't been following me, like I mean, I. I'm the guy who goes on national television and calls Donald Trump a smoking garbage heap of human debris. I mean, I really think Trump's a bad guy. And it's why, if it comes down to a general election between Trump and Hillary, I will stay home. Or I'll vote third party. I, I'm a never Trump person. I will not vote for Donald Trump. He's a personal authoritarian. He, uh, he doesn't care about policy. He doesn't, believe about, he doesn't care about conservatism. All he cares about is, is the glorification of Donald Trump and the trumping of America. And, um, and I will never vote for a person who takes my ideology and, uh, and treats it like Hannibal Lecter, cannibalizing it and then wearing its face around like a mask. I'm not going to do that. Uh, so you spoke a little bit about decisions, um, which, yeah, especially in college, we understand the difference of decision making. Um, my question is, um, you were born in, you were raised in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Um, where, where did you grow up in Los Angeles? Uh, Burbank, in North Hollywood. Okay, okay. Um, and, and what high school did you graduate from? I went to a private high school. Oh. Uh, it was called Yeshiva University of Los Angeles, private Jewish high school. Do you know the demographics of that high school? Upper class. And wholly Jewish. It was a Jewish high school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 91% white, I believe, if not higher. Uh, well, I, n n it's I not, I mean, just statistically, it's not possible for it to be 100 percent or higher. But but beyond that, there were the Judy, Jews are not all white. Just so you know, in fact, half of Jews are Middle Eastern. I'm not saying that it's 91 percent. I'm not talking about whether the Jews are not. I'm married to a non-white Jew. Okay. Right, she's Moroccan. So, um, and what you went to a couple different colleges? Mm -hmm. Well, I went to one, and then I went to law school. Yeah. Um, did you have to work in high school? I. Uh, I had, I did, let's see, did I have a job in high school? No, no, no. Okay. no. And did you put yourself through college? Yes. Fully? I paid my, yes, I paid my own way in college. Good for you. <laughs> is this going anywhere? Or, or, <laughs> at the end you bring out my family and this is where is your life? <laughs> <laughs> my parents made a lot of very good decisions to give me a better life. I hope to make very good decisions to give my child a better life. I hope that you would personally make very good decisions to give yourself a very good life. Would you? Well, this question has now gone on longer than speech. So if you would like to get to the question mark, I'd be happy. Sorry, you kind of interrupted me, so I'm trying to remember so I can say it clearly so you can understand what I'm trying to ask. We're still here. Go ahead. Well, then it wasn't worth mine. <laughs> um, in the beginning of your uh, lecture, you said to, um, in passing, you said to disregard the last 50 to 60 years of United States history. No, I said that, I said that, that institutionalized racism 
Jim Crow ended in the 1960s. Okay, well, building off that, how do you expect to address today's issues mm -hmm. while so easily dismissing the events that led up to today's government? So every history has an impact on individuals, for all individuals. The question is, what do we do now? Right? Do we create discriminatory government policies that, that hurt when they're supposed to help? Or do we set a level institutional playing field with equal law for everyone, which is the ideal? The problem is this. I mean, you can pick any minority group in the United States. And most minority groups in the United States have had negative experiences at the beginning in the United States. You know, it, I, I don't, again, I don't like playing identity politics, but the fact is that there was a time in the United States when people of my ilk, people of the tribe, we were not welcome in country clubs, right? I mean, 70 years ago, not that long ago, 70 years ago, you know, my extended family was being murdered in Europe, right? A hundred years ago, my family was getting here and, and well, 1908, 1907, they, they were getting here and they had literally nothing and didn't speak the language and they were treated badly. Right? I mean, this is, you, this is not unique. History is a nasty place. The question is, what are you going to do now to rise above that? And the only way for people to rise above their history, the only way to rise above the challenges that their parents and grandparents face is for them to make individual good decisions. And what I see from the left is excusing people for making very bad individual decisions on the basis that history has been unkind. So if you're willing to agree, how about this? If you're willing to agree with me that, if you, that people should make individual good decisions, individual good decisions, like don't have babies out of wedlock, right? And these are, there, there's, no man, there's no white man with a gun forcing a black guy to get a black girl pregnant and then leave her. It's not happening. Okay, these are people making individual bad decisions. Okay, if you're willing to agree with me that individuals ought to make individually good decisions and that we ought to foster people making individually good decisions and that individual responsibility is the key to encouraging people to make those individually good decisions, then I'm happy to talk about as much history as you want. But if history is being used as an excuse for people to make very bad decisions and then complain about the consequences of those decisions, I'm utterly uninterested. Okay, no, um, if I could just... Yeah, yeah, sure. Question. Um... There have been things throughout history um, that regardless of the personal's own actions um, have not been able to been rewarded like whites have. And if you look at things like, I'm sure you're well aware of the GI Bill during World yes. War II, how blacks, G, uh, general infantry yes. were not able to get the same I'm benefits. Aware. Yeah. So how can you say with um, the advantages of white people being able to accumulate wealth and the benefits throughout time, mm -hmm. how can you say that hasn't put black people today at a disadvantage because of that? It, okay, it has put black people today at an initial disadvantage, but that does not mean that the rules by which they play are different than white people now. Okay, so the fact is that some people are born poor, and put, put race aside for a second, some people are born poor and some people are born rich in America. Right, we can acknowledge this. Some people are born poor and some people are born rich. That does not mean that, number one, the poor people have a right to go to the rich people and take away their money because that's called theft. And second of all, it also does not mean that making individual good decisions does not allow the poor person to become rich. There's tremendous income mobility in the country even still. And so the idea is, if the idea is that your grandfather, your great-grandfather couldn't go to college because of the racism in the GI Bill after World War II, and that's why you flunked out of high school, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. You know, make good decisions, you will get a better result. It doesn't mean we all start in the same place, we don't. None of us start in the same place. Some of us are smarter, some of us are dumber, some of us are taller, and some of us are shorter. You know, that's, that's the reality of life. That's just how the universe is. The question is what we do to better ourselves. And if the idea is that you get to take money from people who were not involved in your oppression in the first place in order to rectify something that happened to great granddad, then we can play this game of historic grievance all the way down the line. Okay. And if I could just ask one more question, sure. would that be all right? Um, you talk about social mobility. I think that's very important. It's what helped build this country. Um, a lot of people of color, color are living paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. and allows for very little room to move upward. Yes. How would you address that? By better, by, by less market regulation, by less regulation in housing, for example, let people build more housing um, because that's what drives the price down, better supply of housing. Uh, by less government regulation and rent control, which leads to less supply of housing, by allowing businesses to start up and hire people without all of the licensing fees and, and, and taxes that are associated in the state of California, for example, with that, by getting rid of the minimum wage. Because if you want to, if you want, because the minimum, the 
minimum wage puts half of the people who could get those jobs out of work. Right now, you put the minimum wage up at 15 bucks. College grads will be making the minimum wage, and all the people who are 17 and up, they want to start working their way out of poverty, they will not get those jobs. No one's going to pay a 17-year-old kid to flip burgers. Right? It's not going to happen. So what, what, what you need, is less regulation allows for more economic freedom, which is why in the past, when you had less regulation, you saw more social mobility. Social mobility slows as government sticks in the gears of the economy. Um, this is why the inner cities, for example, you know, areas that have been governed by Democrats have very little social mobility. You see permanent poverty, generation after generation, because no one is starting a business in the inner city because of regulations and taxes. This is what happened in Detroit. Right? Detroit got completely cleaned out. Detroit was the industrial heartland of the United States through government subsidies, regulations, and high tax rates that, con that confiscated property and wealth from the people who were generating it. All the businesses left. They raised the taxes again because they felt like they still owed people their money, so they raised the taxes again. More people left. They had no tax base. And so now Detroit is a center of permanent poverty and, and what looks like a zombie after, after math. Any specific last questions? Hi, I'm Steve. Um, was there more tea leaving Bright Park than the Michelle Fields mess? No. That was it? No, it was, it was I, you know, as I said in my public statements at the time, and I won't say more for legal reasons, but as I said, as I said at the time, uh, I believed that, uh, that she was not treated properly by her employer and, uh, and uh, for, for a very, very political reason, and I didn't feel that was right, so I took off. Thank you. All right, and I have one last question. Sure. If you don't mind me asking, um, who will you be supporting in the 2016 presidential election? <laughs> well, when the primaries get here, I, I will be voting for Ted Cruz. Uh, you know, assuming that, assuming that, <laughs> assuming that, that Donald Trump hasn't called for a riot of some sort and the United States hasn't burned down and, and all the rest of it. So. Yeah, now Ted Cruz, my rule about candidates is I vote for the candidate who is most ideologically aligned with me. The minute he becomes non-ideologically aligned with me, I move on to a different candidate. So Cruz is the most ideologically aligned. It doesn't mean he's a perfect candidate. There are a lot of flaws with him as a candidate. Uh, he he you know, speaks like a Baptist preacher, which is not the world's greatest <coughs> campaign strategy. Uh, he, uh, you know, he speaks like a constitutional lawyer. Uh, he doesn't tend to make moral arguments. He tends to make efficiency arguments. And he's got a lot of flaws as a candidate, but his belief system is very much aligned with mine. And so he, he's, you know, assuming that everything goes forward as it currently is, uh, I, will, I will vote for Cruz. If, if, you know, Cruz is out, then I'll vote for any of the other Republicans who are still in, which I assume is John, delusional John Kasich. <laughs> for, the, for the life of me, if, if John Kasich doesn't get the vice presidential nod, I don't know what in the world he's doing. The man is off his meds if he's just sticking around for no reason whatsoever. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. But yeah, so that's, that's, that's my view of the presidential election. And uh, you know, when this whole thing started, I was very optimistic about the way this presidential election was going to go. Now that it looks like it may come down to Trump versus Hillary, which to me is Satan versus the Antichrist, <laughs> then, you know, my, my choices have been significantly limited <laughs> because I can't, pull, I, can't, I can't pull the lever for either of them. <laughs> Thanks so much. I appreciate it. I'm just stopping by to remind you that liberals are insane! <laughs> Social justice warriors are becoming more violent and triggered than ever before! Anyways, be sure to subscribe to KGP TV on YouTube and have a blessed day!